in PyPy, for example, there's like 17,000 tests now. And these tests, especially in the beginning, in the first years, we used those to uh, specify the actual language behavior um, we wanted to make sure that the interpreter um, adheres to. And this actually allowed for sprinting and very fast collaborative cycles. But I guess you, most of you know that. <clears throat> we talk about testing. There is a large area when you talk to like QA environments, they're actually more concerned often with uh, manual testing. And PyTest actually is very much a developer uh, tool. So it's not really directly useful usually to people who have to manually run tests. And I think there's a big gap actually between manual and, and developer testing. And not really many frameworks, but this is really just, I'm just talking about the developer aspect here. And <clears throat> this slide is actually something I usually, um, how I describe testing types. And that's something that kind of like is from experience of the last 10 years or so, but I would even go further than that maybe. The, there's like three different types, unit integration functional I usually distinguish. And a unit test just tests like one piece of um, functionality. Um, integration tests um, kind of like the interaction between two units that might be two classes, two functions or things like this. And system is like the whole thing, like more or less end-to-end, peer-to-peer. Um, and <clears throat> in practice, I'd like to note that, like I just talked to some people from the very nice uh, Rob Collins talk that maybe also some of you uh, saw. In practice, actually integration and functional testing are very, very much together. So in the end, it's really the distinction I usually ma make now is um, unit tests and then rather larger scale kind of like functional tests. But if you have larger systems with many components, then I think integration tests still are kind of like somewhere in the middle um, to do that. And it's quite good that you actually have as a community, we now, um, and this is also used in the Ruby community and others, that we have these terms because eight years ago, there was a complete confusion about all of these, um, uh, you know, terminology. And that's now quite settled. So PyTest, um, the fundamental features, it's a tool that exists already for 10 years, but it has had a lot of um, big uh, milestones where it improved. Um, the, the main thing still is that it tries to be a tool that supports no boilerplate writing of tests, auto-discovery. And um, it, I think when, the, the most interesting thing when, when you use a test tool is what happens if a test fails? I mean, what does the tool allow you to, to do with that? And that's something where it, like, how good is the reporting and, you know, how can you interact, like debugging and things like this. And I think it's important that a test tool actually supports, you know, having better reporting in case you cannot make sense out of a failure. Also something that is by now common knowledge was a unique feature, I think, I don't know, six, seven years ago, is that it's a cross-project tool. Like if you, or maybe even now today, if you use unit test from the standard library and you have your own project-specific extensions, like nice things you do on top of the standard unit test, then it's usually an extension that you cannot easily reuse in another project. It's not so easy usually because it's, like you have some things actually that are tied to your particular project and it doesn't really the whole way how you extend unit test by subclassing and, and things like this doesn't really um, work well with just transferring it somewhere else. You can of course through very careful design you can do it but it's, uh, there's not really a plug-in mechanism for that. The, the most distinguishing feature with PyTest is, I mean there are actually two is um, how do you do assertions and how do you handle, handle fixtures? And that's something we're going to uh, talk about in some detail, what is the current state of PyTest art there. Um, also some other plugins, I'm going to mention that in more detail. So cross-project tool really just means it's a tool that is external to the project that is testing. So basically the whole you know, plugins and everything that you have, they're kind of 
out of your project, but you can still do per project uh, customizations. And then you just point via the command line, you just point to a directory or you point to a certain file that you want to test. And there's a certain auto discovery mechanism that uh, allows to, to find all the tests there by naming convention, which of course can be changed if you like to. The test discovery is, um, the, the rules for that are that everything that has a test um, prefix is found uh, in the files. And then inside the Python files, um, everything that has a test prefix in the functions, so plain functions are fine, and test classes. And this, of course, if you can just do and work from that, becomes very easy to actually write a test because you don't have to import something from somewhere, subclass, and so on. And that's actually, I mean, I gave, when I gave these courses to people, I usually have some people who are not that proficient in Python. And you might have in your organization also people who are not like, you know, expert Python programmers and so on. And I found actually this is maybe a small thing, but for them it's very nice because you don't have to explain subclassing first. Subclassing is to a non-programmer not that obvious. I mean, it's not even always obvious to a programmer. No boilerplate means that you just write a test function with that prefix and you just do plain assertions. So there's nothing, basically no extra knowledge that the test tool requires from you. Um, test classes have the test prefix and um, in, in PyTest you're not forced to use test classes for grouping by setup state. We get to this when we talk about fixtures. Assert introspection. That has been, for some years, it has been a topic where people said, okay, but this is magic. How do you actually do that? And it's, there's some truth to that. I mean, um, PyTest goes a long way. Like, a lot of the efforts actually that went into PyTest was into making this working nicely. And up until two years ago, there was some things that you had to consider and yet you had to know that you don't have side effects in your assert expressions. But that's, since two years, it's not true anymore. You don't have to basically know anything, it just will work, no matter what side effects and so on. And when I say it will work, it means that, of course, assert expressions work. That's what you expect from your assert expressions. But it means that it can show you the intermediate values. So if these assertions actually fail, you will see what is the x. You, know? you will see what is the x here. In this kind of uh, x and, and y or so, you will exactly see what are the uh, values there for which this assertion failed. And as you can see, of course, I think unit test has something like 30 different names for assertions, like the self.assert and so on. And with PyTest, you just don't need that. Um, you just use the normal expressions and you get nice reporting. Um, and you can do some things where I think there's no, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's no um, way to do it in unit test, like this has atra and so on. Of course, you can program that or so, but it's not really um, there. And you would yet have to learn more names. I mean, you have to know all these names. You know the Python expressions already, but you still have to learn all the unit test names. So with that mechanism, you don't need that. Um, the one exception is where you have exceptions. Um, because if you want to say, okay, I call this code, and it's going to raise an exception, that you cannot just, I mean, you could do a try accept yourself, but that's a bit cumbersome to write in tests. So there's a helper that um, allows you to do things, and the, this is basically the version that is now advertised in the documentation. That's uh, the old style where there was no with statement. So you can just say, okay, I know that this is going to raise a value error and then execute me this code block. And if, it, if this code block doesn't raise, then this will turn into a failure because um, it will realize that there was no exception raised or the wrong exception raised and you get a traceback saying, okay, this didn't happen what you expect. Let me maybe just show you some example failures because I didn't show you what the um, sorry, what happened to my, ah, here, failure demo. So, lots of failures. So this is, for example, um, this here is the assertion that I wrote, and this is what PyTest shows. So it shows the intermediate values that were wrong. 
And of course, that also works if you, for example, have function calls here, and then it shows the return values, and so on and so on. So that's not really that um, interesting. What is interesting is um, it shows you when it comes to strings, for example. It goes to great length, actually. There's a lot of code trying to give you very useful information. Like if you compare strings and they only differ in one place, you will see these nice um, pointers here saying, okay, this is exactly what goes wrong here. And that ex extends if you have like, if you compare something like uh, large strings with new lines and you compare x to y, then you will see uh, a diff. So this is using diff lib, uh, showing hey, this line is not there, the other line is there. And if you have very large data, it's, um, it's going to, um, it's going to uh, truncate it. So it says, okay, these characters are all the same, only here is a difference. And you don't need to do anything for that. You just use your normal assert statements and PyTrest at every time tries to present the information, the difference, the failure in a way that is helpful and, and makes you um, quick to understand what is different here and then investigate from there. The same is true for multi-line things. And of course, the same is true if you go uh, for list comparisons. So you have like long lists and at a certain index there's a difference. Or long lists, then it just, you know, abbreviates. And you can usually get the long representation by passing uh, minus verbis verbis and then you get everything in case you want to see more context. The same is um, true, of course, for dictionary comparisons, for set comparisons. So it tells you what, what are extra items there, what I, um, and so on. And it goes on. And on top of that, you can actually even, if you have user objects that you compare, for example, my user object equals another user object, then you can even have a little extension in your project that shows some extra information. Like, is this object having a live database connection? You know, some extra information you always want to see when these objects appear in your traceback. Okay. So there's not really much that you need to know, ex except that um, you can basically use arbitrary data structures in your um, expression. And whenever there's something like a case where you think, oh, but this could be actually presented more nicely, then uh, you can find an issue about that. And you know, at some point, um, this can be improved to have better reporting. This is how this evolved. It's the result of basically one year of um, making this nicer and nicer. And, uh, presentation. Okay, so that's that. Um, that's easy. Some options that you have in PyTest, um, also in other test runners, is um, you have, like, if you run tests and you have, you use print statements or have some logging or something like this, it's going to be captured by each test that is run. So if a test fails, you're only going to see the, the captured output during that test run. With minus s, you can say, please don't do that. Um, I want to see everything just as it goes. Uh, with minus x, you can say, uh, please exit instantly if there's a failure. With minus k, you can say, I know a sub part of uh, the function name. So I just say pytest minus k, you know, database, and then every test that has a database name in it will be um, run, and so on. So there's uh, lots of options. If you don't like the traceback generation that pytest does, um, because it provides a bit more output, as you have seen, then you can also switch to native um, traceback generation, like the Python native one. There's also a short version, and there's some work to be um, published soon on, on having even nicer tracebacks. Minus minus PDB gets you into a Python debugger on a failure. Okay, but the real power actually of PyTest, this is kind of, if you knew PyTest, kind of old news, maybe you don't know the newest assertion reporting, but this is not really, the new thing. And maybe I need to ask, I mean, how many of you know PyTest already? Okay, that's uh, about half. And how many of you have used fixtures from that? Okay, not so many. That's good. And I guess most of you know unit test, right? Unit test is something that you all use, okay. Okay, dependency injection. Huge topic in testing. You can always um, find this. If you do testing b uh, books, they always talk about this concept. Also in the Java world very much and so on. So what is that? Uh, do, without looking there, do you know about dependency injection? Who knows about that? Okay. So I think it's 
it's worthwhile to, to clarify what this actually means. Dependency injection means that if you look at the top um, mail sender example, that is what, is what can be called implicit dependency creation or the, an, an implicit dependency. That means you instantiate the class and somewhere inside there's a dependency to a different component. In this case, the SMTP library from the standard library so that what the mail sender actually does is at some point it makes a mail connection and sends mail out uh, in your application and it creates this dependency on the class responsible for that implicitly. In the second case, it's an injected dependency. It's a, the dependency is injected into the class so that the caller actually has to construct the, the class to, uh, which is going to be used and it passes it in. And this is used for testing because in the first case, if you want to test the functionality, you actually have to patch, you have to monkey patch um, SMTP. So the creation of this dependency on the mail service, you cannot influence it. It's inside the code block of the init. You cannot you know, change it. So you have to monkey patch before you run a test that does it so that you don't require an actual SMTP server somewhere. And with dependency injection, you can directly um, send in an object, dependency inject this object uh, into the other class. And that doesn't need to be a uh, full um, SMTP service, but it can just have enough methods, the methods that this class uses, in order to simulate um, what the whale server is doing. So that's dependency injection. And PyTest actually works with this mechanism on several levels. So a test fixture in PyTest is responsible for setting up objects before you run your tests. And it basically it provides um, a test function or multiple test functions with pre-configured objects uh, from your application. And this is very important to have this factored into some place so that you can reuse this kind of setup for multiple tests, like your database creation with some, some initialized tables and so on. And in PyTest, this is actually done by having test functions um, accept argument values that basically are the fixtures that this test needs. That looks like this. The, the, the test function that you see um, here, it requires a DB object. And that's a fixture. And when PyTest actually wants to execute this, it looks, is there um, a function registered that can provide me this fixture? And that is something that since PyTest version 2.3, you do like here, like this above. You basically just use the decorator and say, this is the function for the DB resource. And it, it basically somehow creates the database. You know? And then suddenly in all your test functions, in that module in this case, but you can also make it project-wide. You can just use the DB argument and get your database. The, just to make sure that everybody understands this, so each fixture has a name. And, and the test functions get um, fixtures injected by looking up a fixture function that satisfies that name. And the fixture functions just return the fixture value. So that's the, the basic um, description of this mechanism. That's not all that you can do. There's lots of things that you can do with fixtures on top of that. For example, um, if you want to say that this fixture is actually something that only needs to be created once per module, then you just write with the decorator, just say, okay, the scope here of this, the caching scope of this fixture is module. And I simulated like a heavy setup of the database by the time sleep two. And um, so I have two tests. Oh, the, the answer here is wrong, I'm sorry. That should be DB, of course. That's a DB here. And both tests use the DB fixture, and, but they will use, ex reuse exactly the same instance. Because PyTest sees, okay, you want to use that, but it's cached on a, on a per module basis. So once it's created, it's just going to be used again. You know? So by that, you, um, you gain that just by modifying your fixture function, your test functions don't need to change. 
They don't need to know because at some point you discover I don't really need a new database every test function. It's fine to just have it per module. You just change your fixture function and you're done. Your tests don't need to, no other source code needs to be um, changed. If you compare that to unit test, um, and of course PyTest also has all these old methods because PyTest actually introduced them and then they were taken to unit test. Um, that is like a set up a function, set up class, set up module, and so on, then you are encoding the caching scope into the source code of the test. And you're doing this encoding of the caching scope basically everywhere, in all of your test files. You say, I do this at setup class level, you know. If at some point you say, no, I actually want to have this on a session scope, then you have to change lots of code everywhere, because your, your caching is basically built hard-coded into your source code. And that's something where PyTest tried to Im improve on this uh, concept by basically focus and fo focusing on doing everything with the fixture functions and letting the tests not um, have to know about this. Parameterizing. If you say, I have two different backends, then I have a Postgres backend, I have a MySQL backend, then um, you can just modify your fixture function again. You can say, okay, there's like, actually there's two parameters, and I have, if anything uses the DB fixture, I want that test to execute twice. Once with the database instance of uh, Postgres, and one with the database instance of MySQL. And no changes needed to your tests, usually. You can just uh, do this on the fixture instance level. You can also parameterize tests directly. Oh, that seems to be a different screen format. Um, <clears throat> so what happens here is that you, um, let me just, uh, oh, well, okay. What happens here is that you basically say um, with this special decorator pytest mark parameterize that this test function gets an argument, in this case arg1, and I say um, arg1 actually um, takes successively different parameters, two and four and so on, two and four and seven, I think, in this case. So this um, function is going to be run as many times with these arguments, like two or three times, depending on the number of arguments here. And um, you can, of course, combine this with uh, other fixtures. So if you have your parameterized db fixture, for example, then you can also list this, like db, comma, arg1, you know, and your whole tests will basically run the whole combinations of, of these uh, possibilities. The reason some people use this very much, um, especially if you have algorithms that, like parsers, for example, they get certain strings and they have a certain AST representation they should produce, or things like this, you basically have a large table, like this is my input, this is my output, this is my input, this is my output, and the test function is very simple. It just takes the input, sends it to some parsing function, and then compares it against the expected output. And you basically just have a data-driven um, input-output um, test. One very important feature here is that this goes further in the sense that um, fixtures, when you have like a database, for example, you might have um, some special application-specific initialization that you want to do on top. So the same thing that when you actually say, in my test function, I want to use the database fixture, the DB fixture, you can now have another fixture that is DB underscore app, has some initialized tables with like default users, whatever. And you can build this fixture by using the already existing fix feature, uh, fixture. So you have a database and then you say, I have a higher level fixture that actually has does some more things on top it takes that other, does some things, and then just um, returns the DB object. So you can, um, you can compose your fixtures easily. And actually, if you have uh, larger applications, then uh, having several, like you have like low-level fixtures and then like higher-level fixtures up to your, maybe your application fixture that takes lots of things, you know, you always reuse the existing fi um, fixtures um, doing that. Classes um, can use fixtures as well, and you, there's one mechanism 
um, that allows you to not list all the fixtures in your methods. So you can just say, okay, this class here uses the clean deer fixture. And the clean deer fixture basically creates a temporary directory and changes into the temporary directory and then maybe puts a default configuration file there or not. It's like a you know, clean thing. So any test actually will have this environment as a fixture, um, like a clean directory where nothing is in there and you don't need to list it because you just work with that assumption. I'm kind of like my current working directory is uh, empty or it can be like your application base layout or something like this. And you can tell um, PyTest with the use fixtures decorator um, that every method here wants to have this kind of default environment. How to use fixtures um, are also interesting. Um, they are a bit like the setup methods in, in unit test, but they also work, for example, on the session scope. You conf test is the file where you can actually put things that should be used for many modules. Like you can put things in one test module, then it's only visible to the test module. If you put them to the conf test file, then they are visible to the whole directory, to everything in there. So um, usually projects have one conf test file where they define all the fixtures basically that the tests uh, use. And um, you might want to say, okay, before any test runs, I need to do like a big initialization of some kind of environment uh, things. And for that, it's useful to say um, uh, it's an auto-use um, auto use fixture. That means there doesn't need to be an explicit reference from a test function or a use fixtures decorator. You can just use uh, auto-use at the fixture definition place. And then this is going to be activated in any case. It's going to be you know, used for your whole test suite. And saying it's a scope session, it's going to be executed exactly once, usually. And um, so before any test executes, this is going to happen. Um, one example for extensibility. If you have a fixture um, where you want to influence the actual test run by a command line parameter, you can also write in your conf test file a so-called pytest hook, which is this pytest add option that allows you to add a command line option. And then the fixture um, takes this special request object, it's a test request object, and it goes to the um, it goes to the config option object that contains the my op value that was defined up there, right? So this fixture just returns the option value. You just, usually you just do something with the option value. Here it just returns it. And that means that you now have the my opt um, option here and can just with some parameter and that will configure your fixture uh, for that particular test run. Of course, you can also read things from an ini file or whatever. So, that was a quick write. Um, it's usually the first day of my testing course with 15 uh, exercises. So it's uh, obviously quite quick to go through all that. Um, what you can do with fixtures is um, you can inject, inject configurable resources into your test functions and you can manage the lifetime very nicely, like the caching scope parameterizations. You can also run things implicitly. Um, and it, it basically provides for a very modular, extensible mechanism to successively build up your testing machinery that you need for your application. So, NOSE, I guess many of you know. A few words about this. Um, NOSE is a, um, it was kind of a clone in terms of features in 2005, and very quickly, I think Jason Pellerin introduced plugins. So at that time, um, Nose was ahead of PyTest in offering that. And uh, but there's many shared ideas um, between that, and it's also true that um, PyTest actually runs Nose test suites usually. So it's for many Nose test based projects, you can just use PyTest as well, and then if you like, successively use features uh, from there. Of course, the fixture things and the asserts are not supported in NOS like I described here in the talk. Unit test, well, I don't really need to go into too much detail there. It's, uh, it's a very particular model of organizing things. It comes from uh, JUnit, which comes from SUnit, 
although that's funny because S unit actually used assert expressions, plain. J unit, uh, Java didn't have that, so they used all these methods. They like these methods in Java. And then uh, I think the Python developers thought that's the true way. <laughs> and they, they, you know, copied that. And also, at the time, uh, there was no way really to get good information out of failing assert expressions. And there's many things that you don't have, at least by default, in unit test. Of course, you can build your own extensions. I've seen the fixture mechanism implemented by some projects, like a subset of that, uh, in unit test, uh, even before PyTest introduced this. Um, PyTest just has a very general um, model of how this um, can be done. Um, yes. I, Recently, people um, started like using PyTest with unit, unit test um, and came up with um, statements like this. So I think if you, it's, there's always quite some effort to keep things, Py, I mean, to allow PyTest to run plain unit test test suites and also plain nose test test suites. It's not the main effort because there's so many other features that um, are there. But usually bug reports, if some behavior is not quite right in terms of supporting uh, nose or unit test, it's going to be fixed. That happened in the last uh, one and a half years because people are interested to do that and um, I think it's going to continue. So if you ever encounter issues there and you want to you know, make sure things work, then you can just do that. Plugins. Tons of plugins by now. Um, I usually have my test run. I'm using usually something like 10 plugins at any given time myself. Um, the PyTest Django plugin is a relatively recent development from the last year, and Andreas Pelmo there will give a talk about this tomorrow, uh, I think 11.15 or something? On, fri on, on Friday? On Friday. Oh, it has been shifted. Okay, I saw something else. Okay. Are you sure? <laughs> really double check. I mean, anyway, he's going to give a talk about PyTest Django. Uh, so I'm not going to do, talk too much about that. Xdist is a very uh, popular plugin that allows you to um, distribute tests. Capture Log uh, makes it nice to show your logging. If you use the logging subsystem, you will see very nice uh, output from seeing your log files. Timeout is also from a guy who's here at EuroPython, uh, Flores. He's not here, right? Um, he um, introduced a way to um, have timeouts so that you can say, by default, I don't want any of my tests to last longer than 10 seconds. You can modify this on the, on the per test level or per class level or things like this or from an any variable um, and so on. Coverage, of course, um, you easily get, you just install that. I'm going to show that. Insta fail, I like both the name and the functionality. Insta fail means not that your tests just fail, it means that when your test run goes on and the, and, the and the test run fails, I mean it has a failure somewhere in between, then usually PyTest reports all the failures combi combined at the end. With InstaFail, um, you, you, you see them while the tests are running. So, you know, it's, it's going and then you get nice reporting in between or oh, here's like the traceback, but the testing continues. So you can also look at what's going on already and see it while the things go. Twisted allows to um, run many of Twisted's, uh, of, of tests written against Twisted. And um, people have successfully used PyTest Twisted, PyTest Django, and the no support, and uh, I think even fixtures to have a test suite that uses all of these things and have one test runner. You know, use PyTest to actually run all of these different um, environments where they usually had to use two or three, like trial for the twisted tests and um, nose for the other tests and so on, and now they can just use these plugins for that. PEP8 actually allows you to configure in a somewhat nice way uh, what kind of warnings you want to treat as errors. So you can have a test run that automatically shows you, your, basically checks your coding style, um, and you can configure that quite nicely. Quick check comes from Haskell. It means that you can very easily tell via decorator um, if you want to have random parameters passed in into your test function. So you say, I want to have an integer in the range of this and that, or I want to have a string of length so and so, 
of these characters or just the full ASCII set or something like that. And this gets actually just, you know, via a random, um, randomizing gets actually passed into your test function and you can just use these random values. And BDD, relatively recently, um, somebody from, um, from PayLogic, where they're also using uh, lots of PyTest, came up with a very nice module for behavior-driven testing. And it's a very nice integration of behavior-driven testing, if you like that, with the PyTest fixture mechanism. There's many more, just look on it, uh, look at the plugins list that you get via PyP. If you just say PyTest, then you will see lots of um, plugins there. Coverage means how does the plugin mechanism work? You just say pip install, and in this case, you just say PyTest minus minus coverage lies, uh, equals uh, path to my package, and then you will see the, um, the coverage for that particular files on that directory um, for your tests or you can get a HTML report. Distribution plugin, you just install it, and you say minus N4, that means it distributes your tests to four sub-processes and runs them in parallel. Minus minus boxed, that's actually Unix only, but some people testing C++ libraries use this. Um, it runs uh, each test in a, in a sub-process, so that if the test crashes because the C library crashes, your test run still continues, and you get basically a segmentation fault for that. That's usually something that you do when you discover that your test run just breaks because you get a segmentation fault, then you repeat the test run with minus minus boxed to actually you know, get a fuller picture of what is breaking and what is just you know, one test causes tr causing trouble. An upcoming PyTest 2.4 feature, and I would like to actually ask you, um, I'm doing this before we introduce this actually, um, Andreas Palmer is, Palmer is a big fan of this uh, feature, and some others are as well. I'm still slightly skeptical. So I ask you, uh, from what you have gathered now from the talk, what does this do? Like, this is my test function. I have, I use this test, um, this fixture. And what does this fixture function now, what does it mean? Any ideas? Yes? I was preparing a question for the end, like mm -hmm. how do you do teardown and cleanup of a fixture? Yes. So I guess yes. this was the answer. This is an answer in 2.4. I mean, the previous mechanism, I didn't actually mention that. It's a good point. Um, there is, uh, there is. Yeah, yeah, of course, there's a mechanism already. Yes, for some reason, the slide is not in there. I'm actually wondering why. But yes, there's a mechanism, uh, request.add finalizer, in a fixture function, how you can register from the fixture function um, a finalizer. You know? So that's already there, that's already there. But this is kind of like a new way to do it. And, okay, so how many of you think that you understand what this means? Okay, great. And I guess all of you that raised your hands, you know what context managers are, right? Okay, and context lib and things like this. Not too many people actually do. And the, the thing is here that, I mean, what happens, this is, the same syntax that you find in the standard library on context lib. Um, mm -hmm. Does the minus mean? No, it's still five minutes to go, right? Yes. Um, the, the context manager means that everything before the yield is actually the enter phase of the with statement that you usually have, context manager. The yield is actually the value that is provided. And what comes afterward is basically the exit phase of the context manager. That kind of like, if you accept this, and you accept the yield statement, it's kind of a nice linear way to actually write your, um, you know, setup, then provide the value, and then do the teardown. Um, yes, so this is probably going to be introduced like this. Um, what it means is, if you have existing context managers from a library, from your application, then you can write fixture functions like this, right? You can just say, uh, this is my application fixture. It uses a DB fixture, and then I use some kind of um, transaction man uh, sorry context manager I have, and I provide my application value within that transaction, and that's all you need. You know, you can just reuse the. If you, if you consider, if you have to split this up over setup and teardown functions, it's going to become very awkward to actually write this. Here, you can just write it like this. 
So this actually works currently on PyTest trunk. Um, and we are still arguing about some details on how to um, make it final. It's going to be there in one way or another. Um, it's basically just the fiction, how to, uh, the question is just how to declare it. So one thing that um, I, I like to do also in, in the courses is that I think the coming up with your testing machinery for an application requires basically similar thought than the application itself. Like how do I configure my resources so I don't have to write totally redundant code everywhere so that I can easily refactor things. So if the instantiation of my application changes, I have exactly one place I need to go to in my fixtures and everything works, right? I'm not spreading my instantiations of all kinds of high level objects like all across the um, test suite in all kinds of setup methods or something like this. So you actually take some thought to have a good, clean, modular design on this depends on this for the application. I need a database, I need a mail sender class, I need this, but I can also have a mail sender fixture that just does the mail sending thing and I have tests just doing that, you know, but it, it builds up basically just like your real system. And you, you kind of like have, especially for functional tests, this is a very nice um, way to go about it. Um, and one thing that is very easy to do is having nice um, reporting on failures. You can add to your test run, you can add lots of extra information that is useful for your particular um, environment. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, some nice feedback from um, people on, on recent developments in PyTest. Always, of course, for an open source project, very nice to uh, see people being very happy about things. And um, thank you very much. Question time. Oh. Hi. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is uh, I saw in your presentation that you allow um, a fixture to be used in more than a test. Is this um, a good way of testing? I mean that uh, there is an interrelation between the two tests and that they can um, change the fixture each other. Mm -hmm. um, yes, good question. Like usually um, you want to have total isolation. And isolation in the sense that um, that each test can, it doesn't matter, the order of tests doesn't matter because they ba basically work from a clean environment. But it's basic, I mean, for development often that's very unnerving because it might take very long, you know, to have every test, have all the setup done for that. And, um, and for that you can, I mean, what you can do in PyTest is that you can say, okay, for during development, I actually have caching scopes, sometimes of session, of module, whatever you like, you know. And then in my continuous integration run, there's, I didn't show the example, but in the continuous integration run, you can, um, you can have a command line option that says, no, here I'm actually going to have a run that takes longer because the application is going to be recreated for every test function, you know. So you can do this basically from the command line and uh, so you can change it between development time and um, continuous integration time, um, kind of like taking the best of both, both approaches. Okay. Second one is uh, about uh, a migration uh, to PyTest. Is there any migration? migration? Migration from unit test ah, okay. to yes. yeah. Uh, is there any documentation about it or, or some scripts to um, to be able to do this? Yes, I mean, there's only one thing. I mean, there's not a guide or something like this because, um, yeah, not because. I mean, that's, it's not there. <laughs> um, the, the one thing is what, is what usually works, and many people have done, is they just do it incrementally. So they don't port all of their test suite. They just, you know, start using PyTest as the test runner and also in continuous integration. And then they can actually start 
using features and whenever they actually touch a certain test module, they say, oh, but this can be done much easier and, you know, rewrite it um, uh, locally, basically, just in that test module. And so you incrementally um, get uh, somewhere else. And in terms of tools, there is something called, um, something called um, PyCommand, like this, right? And this has an old conversion script, convert unit test, pi.convertUnitTest. And if you pass in um, the typical unit test um, test case and um, with like self.assert and so on, it, it rewrites all of these assert names, like assert equals, assert not equals, assert whatnot, you know, into normal plain assert expressions. That's the main effort. It's, but that's really the only thing that it does. And I, I'm not sure how completely up to date it does with all the methods. But this could be, um, you know, done further, I think. But or like the, the no test, uh, nose test, it will run the normal unit tests if you... If yes, you as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have to... No, you don't have to convert all this. But if you at some point decide, actually, the assert expressions are much easier to read, you know. And also, I mean... If you look at actual, I don't want to talk too bad about unit tests, but if you look at actual code, people actually also often do this. You know, they actually say um, has atra x comma y, right? And this, in the end, doesn't give you much information anymore. If that fails, then all is true, you know. I think it's like this. I've seen this a lot. Because some things you cannot just easily express, or you don't remember the name anymore, or how, you know, how this is done, or you need to run on Python 2.6, they didn't have these methods, and, you know, and all these kinds of reasons, you just uh, write something like this, and then you don't get any kind of reporting, except it fails. You know? And then you actually might decide, okay, let's just um, convert this, and if you just use the conversion script, this will just make that. And then suddenly you get nice reporting. So it's actually an improvement over existing. But sure, I mean, you can just still use the, uh, you can use PyTest first to just run your test suite and then, you know, at some point migrate file by file or whatever suits you. Oh, hello, I have a question. Uh, from Lazy Guy, do you have integration with the e X unit reporting? Because what? I'm lazy, X unit, you know, it's used by Jenkins, the oh, Java oh, oh, yes, stuff. Oh, yes, oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I wasn't very complete in terms of features, but um, if you look at PyTest minus, oops, let me just, it's probably not so easy. Is that easy enough to read still? So, yes. Ah, uh, okay. Right. JUnit XML, um, there's lots of different options. And I think the PyTest documentation also has a, has a PDF, kind of like 100 pages or something like this. And it explains many of these things. And there's an, on pytest.org, oops, sorry. On pytest.org, there's an example section. Um, if I get there, um, there's an example section that you can navigate on the right side that has lots of different examples for Jenkins and you know lots of things. Yeah. The second question: uh, In uh, I'm using cleanup methods in tests because I'm lazy. Do you have a uh, solution for this? Yes, I, sure. I, I, clean up, uh, for I have to admit that I somehow seemed to have messed up um, uh, the slides, because there was a slide on this, I'm sure. Um, I seem to have grabbed the wrong previous slide set. So yes, if you have, um, I'm just going to type it very quickly. If I have a fixture like this, then I can just say, um, uh, uh, um, Request at finalizer some function, and this function can say finalizing, you know? And then I have a test function that uses the fixture and um, says test called, and here I say um, fixture setup, and then if I run that, um, it's like this, fixture setup, test called, finalizing. So that's very much at the top of the documentation. I'm sorry I missed that slide here somehow. Um, and of course, if you do this and you have, for example, uh, if you do this uh, like this, and then you say, um, oh, just use a session scope, you know, then, and you run this again,
Then the fixture setup, test called, test called, fixture teardown, right? That's what you would expect. I mean, it's, if you change the scope, it just means that the, um, the, the setup and the teardown, I mean, the cleanup is called accordingly. This completely avoids, if you use this kind of mechanism, it completely avoids the question of partial setups and partial teardowns. You know, in unit test, there was big discussions about, uh, I run the test setup function, the setup function fails, then should the teardown function run or not? Because partially it has done something already and so on. And because PyTest splits this into fixtures anyway, any fixture that actually sets up something, like creates a value here, right? It will just um, say, um, just do it like this, you know? So it's exactly at the point where I create it and now I know how to finalize it, I just add it. And that's the equivalent you have in unit test is called add cleanup, but that only works on the per function scope. So if you want to use that on the class or module level, it doesn't work, you know? So this is independent of that. It works on all levels, at session level or whatever, and um, makes it much easier. And for everybody who uses knows, um, I pushed Magical, the Wush author, he also uh, used knows. I said, well, we could just use pi.test and uh, he, we just switched to it and it just worked. So it was no issue at all. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this looks very impressive. I'm thinking to convert some tests to it. Uh, and I, I'm wondering, uh, like, this is something that I've been doing mostly by myself, like some mocks and stub objects for tests. Is there some support for that in PyTests or maybe in plugins? Yes, there is something. I mean, the, the basic form of mocking, in, I mean, of course, you can use Michael Ford's nice mock library, right? That's or or Kumar's, um, I think, stub it's called, or so on. PyTest itself has a built-in, uh, there, there are some built-in fixtures, like a temporary directory and things like this, and there's one that's called monkey patch, right? And the, uh, that basically works like, I mean, what you basically do is you just say, uh, oh, I just accept monkey patch, and then I, I say um, monkey patch, uh, uh, sorry, monkey, yes, monkey patch, set atra os.path, apps path, whatever, you know, so it returns so, like this. So I just say, um, patch me out that function on that level from the fixture, and um, when I do this, then os.path, apps path from whatever is going to give me um, this. Right? You just. What was not closed? Uh, no. Ah, this. I'm sorry. Yes, I should have even seen that. Anything else? Real life. Um. Oh, it doesn't work at that scope. Yes, that's true. So we just use functions. So sorry. Like this. So that. Um, what it does actually, the monkey patch is really, it is another fixture that when you use the set atra, on something, uh, registers a finalizer, so when the fixture ends, it's going to clean it up again. So in that sense, if your fixture actually requires something to be patched out, um, you can do that. I recently saw, for example, there's a fixture um, from somebody in a plugin uh, on, on PyP that uh, tries to mock out all network access. So it, basically by using that fixture or activating it on a session scope for your test, for your tests or whatever scope you want, it, um, it basically prevents your tests from accidentally depending on network. Because all the uh, you know, HTTP stuff and everything that is just patched out to none, and whenever you actually end up there, then it's just an error. You know? So there's... So what kind of scopes exist for fixtures? I mean, it's a string, so can you just throw in anything or? Currently there's function, uh, class, module, session. And in the future there's going to be probably something like test run. That's the idea currently. Because if you have a distributed test run, like across multiple processes, each of the processes is treated as its own session. And often there are sometimes resources that you don't want to be replicated in that setting. 
So the idea is there to say there's an even higher scope, which if you have a single process run, it's going to be the same as session. So session test run are the same. But if you have, if you distribute it across multiple um, uh, test processes, then there's only going to be one. And PyTest is going to care that there's only going to be one database, for example, that is actually started as an external process, for example. Right? I have no, not a question, but uh, just a proposition. And uh, first, I want to s say thank you for PyTest, because I don't think there is an analog uh, of PyTest, and uh, it can compete with it. So it's like the standard now. And uh, second is, uh, I th I'm seeing a, a lot of issues on Bitbucket for now. And uh, I understand you are eager to include more new features, more nice things. But how about to concentrate on polishing uh, existing stuff? Mm -hmm. And also, we have two days uh, of sprinting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes. uh, what about having some little sprint? Yes. And, uh, I would uh, like if uh, someone will join. Mm -hmm. At least I will be. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's good that you mentioned that. I mean, on Saturday morning, we're going to sit together and, and fix some um, PyTest things. Most, except for one or two of the current bugs reported, I would say are not that critical. critical. I mean, there's very few people being hit by bugs. I think the ordering bug of conf tests, if you have multiple conf test levels or something like this, but don't do that, you know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> not many people do. I mean, my user recommendation is don't make it too complicated. I mean, usually you one conf test file where you have your global fixtures and then some extra fixtures and in, um, that's enough. You are advanced, I mean, you and your company are very advanced users of, of this, and this is an issue that maybe we can finalize the fix, and actually Flores is the one who has the pull request, so we can look at that, right? But I agree, I mean, some kind of bug fixing uh, day would be great, and um, maybe regular each month or something like this. But I, I also think there's not really, despite the number, um, there's not really that many where I have the feeling many people are suffering. Um, I need to hear more suffering reports to... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how it works. Or some bribery, you know. Bribery also works. <laughs> uh, one yes, there was somebody there, uh, sorry. Uh, well, I actually have two, but I can start with uh, one first. Uh, with the fixture definitions, I, I really like Michael Ford's patch library. Uh, can I actually, like, or the mock library, can I actually use, like, a, how fragile are, is the fixture definitions, can I just... Can you use what exactly? Uh, I like the Michael Forge uh, mock library, and I wonder how fra fragile the fixtures are. Can I just patch, add like patch something like, on fixtures instead? Like this, right? Yeah, but on, but on fixtures, so that you know, I would have a fixture that would do the same patching every time, or do I need to do the manual dance? Yes, yes. Ooh. It should be quite possible. I mean, it's really just Python functions. If you have your, in your yeah. fixture, you decide to use the mock library and do things and patch out things with the mock library, fine. Okay, that great. It should be just great. I mean, another, another quick question. The assert function, is it uh, predefined what you can run there or can you just throw, or not like the assert syntax? Can you just throw anything there or? Anything. Oh. Anything. Nice. That's I wonder fine. why I still use nose. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You can throw everything, yes. The, 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 the code was mainly done, I worked together with that with uh, Benjamin Peterson. You know, he was the release manager for part of the Python 3 series, and he's very intimate with the AST module. And there's, over the history in PyTest, there's three generations of doing assert expressions, you know. And um, the latest one is really good. I mean, it's, uh, we finally, I think, solved the problem. Um, so you can just use asserts and should not need to worry at all. Um, at our project, we still have a little problem with upgrading from 2.2, I think, to 2.3. Is there another um, bigger step fr from 2.3 to 2.4? To 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 no. I mean, I, we try very hard to make have no upgrading pain, basically. And so there's a very strong focus on backward compatibility. The approach that PyTest, I mean, I don't really, I would like to know what exactly the problem is in 2.2, 2.3. Not now, maybe, but, you know, let's look into that. But we, we, usually we try to, um, to avoid any uh, issues there. 
And if you look at some of the plugins, they were published one and a half years ago. And PyTest usually sees a release every couple of months, like two, three months or so. And all of these plugins continue to function, despite new things being added and so on. And that's by design. I mean, we try to keep it this way. Um, and you can imagine it's not so easy because um, the documentation has all the nice, new, shiny features, how you do things. But all the things that were documented three years ago, they also work. They just cease to be documented uh, to a certain level. So it gives you some kind of incentive to, you know, but it's not going to break. E I mean, there's very, very few things since the last three or four years that, that broke in terms of, and I think that's a special requirement for testing tools. It's just so much sucks if you upgrade your testing tool and things starts breaking, right? And I understand that. So, and uh, basically we try from PyTest development to um, avoid this problem as much as we can. Any more questions? I think everybody wants a coffee. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.